Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it, it is one of those days when we are, are joyful to be gathered together in worship. It is good to see so many faces that are family. As we prepare for worship, I want to invite you, if you're worshiping from home, take a moment to fill out the connection card. You'll find the link to it in the comments on, on Facebook or YouTube. Let us know you're here. There's a space for you to share your prayers. Uh, we encourage you to do that. If you're worshiping here in the sanctuary, your connection card is in the pew back in front of you. Take a moment and fill that out. Um, share your prayers. We, are, we, are, we celebrate the opportunity to be a praying community together. Um, if you're, you're new worshiping with us or, or returning to, to worshiping with us in the sanctuary, we just want a quick note that the communion is in the pew back in front of you. Um, when it, it's time, you can take one of those communions, open the bread first um, so that you don't spill the juice, and when you're done, you can just place it back in that tray and someone will take care of that. If you're worshiping from home, gather whatever elements you have on hand for communion so that we can celebrate together. And now I invite you, as you are able, to stand and join us in our call to worship. Come, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. We will make known God's deeds among the people. Let us sing praises to God. We will tell of all God's wonderful works. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We will praise God's holy name as we worship.
Often, we want only to hear words of encouragement and support from Scripture. We love to focus on Jesus loves me, those kind of positive, encouraging statements. And yet, when we read, we find that much of the Bible challenges us with hard teaching and difficult directions. The book of Acts reminds us that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Luke records Jesus teaching, sell your possessions and give alms, offerings for the poor. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And Mark's gospel hits hard with Jesus saying, I assure you that this poor widow who has put in more than everyone, all of them are giving out of their spare change, but she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. How countercultural is this? Many of us delight, I do, in adding to our possessions. And we're often flummoxed by the idea of creating treasure in heaven. In addition, shouldn't we be concerned with having enough money, maybe even an abundance of, of money, to pay for those things that we need? What are we to do with these stories that fly in the face of so much that we value and understand and believe. But we are reminded that Jesus points out that giving is the point. Giving brings life. Giving is the blessing. And so we are invited to share our financial gifts today, knowing that some of what we give will in fact go to those who are poor, and, and feed those who, who are food insecure with backpack buddies, to support women who have been released from prison as they get back on their feet, to offer needed resources for disaster relief and recovery. Your freely offered gift will make a difference in this world. The kind of difference that Jesus calls us to. And so with gratitude for the challenge in Jesus' teachings, let us offer our gifts to God.
generous God, you give us so much. Thank you. Thank you for giving us Jesus who, who challenged his followers with so much of what he taught. Thank you for giving us the promise of your kingdom. Thank you for this opportunity to give, allowing each of us to participate in the work of love that Jesus lived. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to invite the children to meet me in front of the, the communion table for a special time of worship. Hi, friends. How are you? Are you good? Yeah? So this week, I want you all to come closer, because this week a letter came into the office that I thought might interest you. It is addressed to FCC kids. Is that you? First Christian Church kids? That's us. That's y'all. But I don't know who it's from. It doesn't say. Lottie, will you open it for me? Okay. So I wonder what's inside. Do you, do you, do you want to guess? It might be. It might be. Hmm. What do you think? Piece of paper? You think there's something inside? <gasps> there is something inside. Calvin, do you think you could read this for me? Is it a hard word? Which one is it? You faced trials. That is a hard word. Hmm. hmm. Greetings. Think of it as pure joy, my sisters and brothers, whenever you face trials of any sort. I don't know if I like that. Do you like that? Yeah. You do? Consider it joy when you have hard things happen. Does that make you happy? No? Maybe? What do you think James meant by this? Who is James? Hmm. I think this James is the guy who wrote the book uh, that we are studying today in worship. James wrote a book of the Bible. And this is how he starts the letter that he wrote that's in the Bible. Hmm. What do you think James meant by that? Have you ever faced hard things? Have you had a hard... What, what kind of hard things have happened? Lots of hard things have happened to you guys, haven't they? Yeah. Things that, that maybe made you sad or maybe even cry. Things happened that when you didn't know what to do to, to, to solve them. Did that bring you joy? No. So what do you think James meant? I, I wonder. I remember that when James wrote this real letter back in Jesus' day, he wrote it to Christians who were scattered all over. And they were going through tough times. So I wonder if he was trying to be encouraging. If he was trying to say, hey, even though things get hard, you can trust God. You're not alone. But you can always rely on each other and on God. You think maybe? There's joy in that, isn't there? That even when things get hard, you have people who, who love you? When things get hard, you have people you can ask for advice? You have people who will give you a hug if you need it. Or be your friend in, in th when things are difficult. So maybe that's what, what James meant. I like that. To remember that we're never alone no matter what happens. What do you think? Maybe? Why don't we say a Nito Repito prayer and then you can either head to Worship and Wonder or back to sit with your friends and family. Does that sound okay? All right. Dear God, we know sometimes things will be hard. Help us remember 
you are always with us. We can find joy with you. Amen. All right, friends, if you would like to go to worship morning, Miss Laura is in the back. Just watching our children brings me joy. Seeing the ways that they um, mirror God's, God's image for us brings me deep joy. As we enter into a time of prayer this morning, I want to invite you to take a deep breath and breathe in God's Spirit and then breathe out all that has burdened you. Let us go to God in prayer. Mysterious God, power behind all we see, grace beyond all we know, love before all we meet. We cannot comprehend your majesty. We only know your presence in our lives. You who knew us before we were even born. You who will cradle us after our last breath. We cannot encompass your glory. Instead, we marvel at all the works your hand has made. And we worship you, O God. It seems too good to be true that you would care for mere mortals like us in our messy lives, often caught up in trivialities that that you would mold us in your own image. Social creatures with a divine spark. So good. We find it hard to believe. So good. We sometimes would rather not believe. Rather not see your image in those around us. Crying out for love and companionship. Rather not see your wisdom underpinning creation, groaning at our wanton waste and exploitation. God, above all, help us with our unbelief that you would love us. Save us from our self-preserving acts which isolate and harm. Pour your mercy into our hearts and our souls, giving us eyes to see and ears to hear your gift. In ourselves, indeed in every person, in every place, in every moment. For your greatness is seen in all the world. May our words and actions be our praise of you. May we strive to live into your goodness made real for us in the person of Jesus, who taught us so much, including how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Most of you have probably been to the beach. Not necessarily Panama City or down at Gulf Shores, 
that's where I like to go, but you've been to the beach at some point. Almost everyone loves the beach, except for Bruce McKenzie. <laughs> now, Bruce isn't here today, and I'll probably look out there where he's supposed to be sitting, but he knows I'm going to say this. Not, he doesn't know what I'm going to say. He knows I'm going to use his name, but he's watching on Zoom. He doesn't like the beach because he says he's had military training and he knows how to fight, but he doesn't like sand-to-sand -sand combat. <laughs> That's a pretty good one for Bruce. But most of us do like the beach, and we like it because of things like this. A big old sand dollar, and a, I don't know if this is a big old starfish. I don't know how big starfish get, but this is a starfish. And um, maybe a big scallop. These are called scallops. This one's probably a queen scallop. But unfortunately, most of the time when we're hunting for these shells, we, we don't find this kind. Uh, but we, what we do is we find these little bitty kinds. And we love them, and we pick them up and take them with us, get our hands full of them and take them and clean them up and then put them in a baggie. <laughs> <laughs> and we take them home with us. And then I don't know what happens to them. <laughs> but let's call these gifts from the beach. Somehow, that big old ocean calls to us. When you can look at the horizon and there is nothing but water as far as your eyes can see, and who knows how deep it goes, it gives us a special kind of peace. A peace as you said in your prayer, that we can breathe in and feel. That's probably because that feeling is so drastically different from man-made tensions that are a part of our daily lives. Psalm 131.2 Stilled and quieted my soul. Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. Looking out at the ocean, we can easily think of God, our Creator, who gave us all of Earth's majesties because He loves us. And when we share communion, we remember that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus, his only son. And Jesus loves us so much that he died on the cross for us to take away our sins and give us the promise of heaven. Here the bread is served for Jesus' body and the cup is served for Jesus' blood. Let's call these gifts from the table. Here, everyone is invited to share because here there is nothing but accepting love. It is wider than any horizon and deeper than any ocean we can imagine. It's the unconditional love of Jesus. June, let us pray. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for Kathy and Robin's special message this morning. With grateful hearts, 
We have come to this table of love in remembrance of Jesus Christ, your Son. It makes me think of the song, Out of His Great Love, He's Picking Me Up. And Lord, you do that for us often. You loved us, Lord, enough to send your Son for our sake and redemption, and we thank you. Jesus loved us enough to give his life, shedding his blood on the cross that we might be saved. We are grateful. Bind us together in Christian love. Empower us with your spirit as we eat this bread and drink this cup to dedicate our lives to serving you through serving others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Our scripture reading this morning comes from James 1, 13 through 15. No one when tempted should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. take me long to discover that having a little sister was going to be the absolute best thing that happened to me. My sister Kay was born when I was 18 months old, and it took me all of about six months to take full advantage of this gift from God. One day, I found a red marker. Someone had left it lying around in my two-year-old reach. And I took that red marker and I promptly drew an amazing family portrait, life-size to a two-year-old, all up and down the hall in our house. And when my mother caught me, she said, Who did this? And I sweetly replied, Kay. Kay did it. Kay was in her crib. She couldn't crawl even. Certainly couldn't walk or hold a marker yet. 
But this continued for several years. Who let one of my good silver spoons be eaten by the disposal? Okay? Who made this big mess in the bathroom? Kay. Most definitely Kay. Who got a dent in the front bumper of the car? Kay. Kay was the perfect scapegoat. Always there to take the blame. And you know what a scapegoat is, right? But, but did you know that this concept actually comes from the Bible? In Leviticus, we hear about the original scapegoat. On the Day of Atonement, the, the annual day to atone for sins, the Israelite people would gather. And the high priest Aaron was instructed to bring two goats to the tent of meeting and place them before the presence of the Lord. One goat is for the Lord. And it is to be sacrificed as an offering to God. The other goat is for the Israelite people. And Aaron, the high priest, is instructed to go out to where the people are and to take his hands and lay his hands on this goat where he is to offer a confession for all of the sins of the people, for their wickedness and their mistakes and their rebellion against God. And then that same goat, the scapegoat, is sent running into the woods. It's led away, carrying with it all of the people's sins away from God to a remote place. The scapegoat takes the sins of the people away. Now, I want to say as the high priest of First Christian, I am really glad that we don't have to do this practice. Because I can't imagine what it'd be like to lead a goat down Valleydale Road trying to find some wilderness for it to take all of our sins off. <laughs> but this Jewish tra uh, tradition was passed down for generations. And th this is where the idea of making someone a scapegoat for our sins comes from. It comes from Leviticus chapter 16. And it's little wonder then why theologies were developed that talk about Jesus being our scapegoat. The theologies say that we don't need scapegoats anymore because Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, came into the world and offered to take our sins on Himself and remove our sins from us and redeem us so that we don't need scapegoats. But here's the thing. We kind of still like having scapegoats around, don't we? Even as adults, we're always looking around for a good goat to blame. Last week we started a new sermon series, The Devil You Know, and, and, and in the first sermon we discovered that much of what we have come to know about the devil is not really scriptural. It comes from history, a history of, of literature and art and culture and, and film. But look what someone gave me as a gift this past week. It showed up at my house. A lovely tea towel for my kitchen. Uh, I used this in the sermon as a sermon illustration last week. Uh, and of course, if you drive north from Montgomery up to Birmingham, you pass this billboard all of the time. I mean, you start a sermon series on the devil and you never know what you're going to get. Today, we're continuing in the series and we're going to talk about one idea uh, of the devil that is really prevalent. And that idea is that the devil made me do it. It's something we say flippantly. Uh, after we make a horrible choice. I don't know why I did it. The devil made me do it. And after my sermon last week when we were talking in the narthex, John Allen said to me, um, do you know who Flip Wilson is? And I said, yes. Yes, I know Flip Wilson. My parents loved him. And so when I was a child, we watched his show all the time. And I know some of you don't know him. You're, you're too young to have seen him but um, I want you to know who he is, a wonderful comedian. There's a, a picture of him, um, and he had his own TV show. 
in the 70s. You can see his sketches today on YouTube. So if you don't know Flip Wilson, I implore you, go to YouTube this afternoon and and check out uh, some of his sketches. Flip Wilson is largely responsible for the rise in prominence of this phrase, the devil made me do it. He used it in one of his sketches. Uh, There were two characters in the sketch. One of them was the reverend, uh, who was the pastor of the church of what's happening now. And the other was his wife, the, the reverend's wife, named Geraldine. And Geraldine would say all the time, the devil made me do it. When the reverend would see her come in with a new package, he might say, oh, Geraldine, have you been on another shopping spree? And she would say, I didn't want to buy this dress. The devil made me buy this dress. I was just walking down the street, minding my own business, and the devil started following me. And then he was telling me that I looked really good, and then he sneaked up on me and leaned over my shoulder and whispered, look at that dress over there, Geraldine. It's on sale. It's your size, too. You you need to try that dress on. And I said, cut it out, devil. Leave me alone. But the devil said, look, It doesn't cost anything to try it on. You owe it to yourself to try this dress on. I said, I'm not even trying it on, devil. And that's when the devil pushed me in the door. And he made me try on that dress. And then he took out a gun and he made me sign your name on the check. I think that what Flip Wilson was doing in his comedy was highlighting an idea that had been passed down through history that the devil could make you do something. Throughout Christian history, there's been a long-held fear that somehow we are going to be made out of our control. Afraid that that when it comes to making a decision, the devil's going to get you. That once he's got a hold of you, you're no longer going to be able to control yourself. This was a a rampant fear in the Middle Ages. It it was a great time of fear around wizardry and witchcraft and sorcery and all sorts of uh, people were captivated with the idea that um, there were demonic forces, demonic powers that would grab hold of people. And it was said that these people, who by the way were primarily women at that time, had had been captured by the devil and, and, and made to worship him and entered into a relationship with the devil to gain certain power. And so these people began to, to be held as suspicious. This led to the persecution of many so-called witches. And as this persecution became more prevalent, it was encouraged and even expanded on by the church. Any heretic or non-believer could be accused of being in league with the devil. So much so that, that Pope Eugene IV issued an edict saying that witches were to be killed summarily and with ado and without judiciary form. Which means if you think somebody's a witch or in the grasp of a devil, kill them. It's your duty. Throughout the Middle Ages and into the Spanish Inquisition, thousands of people were killed. Innocent people. And we saw that rise again in the late 1600s with the Salem witch trials right here in our land. People who believed that the devil could grab a hold of you and force you to do something, it it led to the deaths of thousands countless numbers of innocent people. All these fears, they're born out of an idea that an evil, malignant, demonic force is going to be able to force us or trick us into acting away in a way that's contrary to our Christian morals and beliefs. That the devil's going to get a foothold on us and never let us go. But there's a problem at the heart of this image of the devil. It's that our own impulse as human beings to sometimes want to blame someone else for our own bad choices 
We love a good scapegoat. We, we want someone else to blame when something bad happens to us. I didn't have to be old enough to understand the concept of scapegoating when I blamed my sister Kay with the red marker still in my hand. I wasn't old enough for my parents to have sat me down and taught me about responsibility or about what sin is. I just knew that I'd done something I wasn't supposed to do and I did not want to get caught. I didn't want to accept the blame. My friend John says when something goes wrong, when, when sins are committed, we're looking for a patsy to take the blame for our bad behavior. Little Bobby isn't a, a bad student. He's just got bad teachers. We don't like to take blame. And, and this carries over into our theology where we, we don't own up to our actions or our inactions, our sins. When we do something we shouldn't. Oh, oh no, no, no. That, that wasn't really me. The devil's just been working on my heart lately. The devil made me do it. I had a seminary professor, Dr. Dowd, an amazing Baptist woman who used to say, y'all folks just love to blame the devil for everything. Blame the devil for your sins. You don't even like to say the word sins. You just prefer to be soft and say trespasses. She would say it. She would say it just like y'all say trespasses. You know that word is sins, S I N S, sins. You might as well just really confess it. Forgive me of my sins. But it's so much easier for it to be the devil's actions, isn't it? The devil is really wreaking havoc on my finances right now. Really? Maybe it's your poor money management or your shopping addiction or your desire to keep up with the Joneses, do they have anything to do with it? Is it all the devil? The devil's out to destroy my marriage. Really? Or could it be that you have workaholic tendencies or that you don't prioritize health of your relationship? Could it be that your marital issues are, are powered by you and your poor choices? Whatever happened to taking responsibility for ourselves? and our own actions. Taking responsibility for our choices. Here's where I think the church and all of us could take a lesson from Alcoholics Anonymous. I served a church for 11 years that had several members who were in AA. And through those years, they taught me so much about taking and owning responsibility. There are 12 steps if you're not really familiar with AA, and they're filled with personal responsibility and with something else. And I, I want us to look at them um, for just a few minutes. I'm going to read them to you. You'll see them on the screen. Um, 12 steps. Number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. Four, made a, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, Continue to take a personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. And twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. 
when you hear these 12 steps, who do you hear has power there? It's you, the individual, and God. There, there's no talk about the devil or evil forces in this, uh, these 12 steps. There are no excuses, but there is a reminder that God's power can change Lives In the case of AA, change the lives of alcoholics. But I think this pattern of living in God's power is something we should all take very seriously. I, I believe that there are forces of evil in the world. I've experienced some, and I, I'm guessing you have as well. But we cannot give the devil more credit than he is due. The devil didn't make us all do it. We give the devil more credit. We do it all the time. But you know who didn't do it? Jesus. Jesus did not do that. He was tempted, yes. But He acknowledged the temptations and then He moved on. And when He encountered demons, He cast them out and moved on. And Jesus did not attribute every hardship or every suffering that He faced to the devil. The devil may have been a reality, but not an insurmountable one. One of the hardest things for us to do as humans is to take responsibility for ourselves. To say that my sin is my doing. God has given us this amazing gift of life and when it comes to Uh, What comes with it is is free will. And so we're free to choose God or we're free to go another direction. We're not under the control of some evil uh, devil that makes us choose bad things. We choose where we go. We choose to follow God's lead. We're free to make righteous choices and free to make sinful ones too. But the will to do that which is good over that which is evil, it comes from inside our human hearts. That's what our Scripture was saying today. You might not have been able to hear all of it uh, since Kathy got a little bump from the the early sermon uh, uh, video. The devil made the tech do it. (laughs) Um, But in, in the Scripture from James... We hear that, that what James says is the temptation we feel, it's there inside of us. Temptation comes from our own desires and those desires have the power to lead us down a path of sin which leads us to death. It's not from some outside power. It's not something that's gotten a hold of us making us do something we don't want to do. Because, look, I know me And I am fully capable of making bad decisions. I I can do bad all by myself. And I know you can too. It was neither the devil nor my sister that put that red marker in my hand. I did it on my own when I was so very young. And I wish that I could say that it had stopped there when that bad decision could just be erased with some paint. We're capable of doing bad all by ourselves. No third party needed. We know what's right and we know what's wrong. No one tricks us or enslaves us or deceives us. The only one who tricks us is us. We deceive ourselves. Convince ourselves into doing something that we know is not right. We do it in our relationships and in our church and in our neighborhoods. We do it all the time. You do it and I do it. But what I would like, what I would like for all of us, what I would like for the world is for us to be a generation that learns to take responsibility for our actions and our choices. So if there is a temptation to resist, friends, let it be this. Let us not be tempted to absolve ourselves from responsibility by blaming evil forces outside of ourselves. It's, it's a hard thing to do. And we don't like it. And we would much rather blame someone else. Jesus took the world 
the, the sin of the world on Himself, not so that no one would ever have to admit sin, but to show us God's limitless love and a grace that offers second chances, a, a mercy that brings forth new life rather than death. So as followers, followers of Christ, we're called to take responsibility for our own sins. So maybe this week, in prayer time, we could all spend a little bit of time thinking about who it is that, that we've sinned against recently. What choices have we made that we've cast off and blamed someone else for? Where could we be more responsible Christ followers? What circumstance do we need to say, I don't know how I got here, but I am responsible for it and I am sorry I ask for forgiveness. I want to make amends. Friends, you are God's beloveds. God has given you the power to take responsibility and seek forgiveness. We have the power to do that and here is the good news. Just as surely as sin gives birth to death, responsibility and repentance, they give birth to new life. And there is no scapegoat required. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, You created us in Your goodness. You, you created us to have choice. Forgive us when we choose to deny our holy createdness. When our decisions lead us down paths that You do not desire for us to go. When our actions or our inactions cause hurt for others and ultimately for ourselves. Help us through Your merciful power to take responsibility for our choices, for our actions. And, and then give us courage, O oh God. Give us courage to confess our wrongs, our sins and to seek amends to those we have hurt. Most of all, grant us the wisdom to become a light on a hill that shines Your goodness. For it is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand Lord, I would place my hand in thine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. By water still, or trouble see, tis is thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand. Faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he needed me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan. By his own hand, he needed me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand.
You were created in God's holy image with the power to do amazing work. So go from this place into a new week of life. Let God lead you. Go with Christ. Amen.